Hello, Westside. Welcome to our class. We're calling the Letters of Peter. Uh, this is Lesson 5 in our series on, uh, on the Letters of Peter, and it puts us in 1 Peter chapter 5. So I hope you'll turn there as, as uh, we begin here, uh, continuing to look at what Peter has to say to churches in the uh, western area of uh, Asia Minor, uh, writing likely from Rome, writing to a church that's uh, under persecution and uh, under the, the reign of Nero, a time when emperor worship was being encouraged and applauded. And uh, Christians refused to participate in that. And as they did, uh, they were uh, they were persecuted and they were they were uh, uh, under trial. Uh, so it was it was a tough time for Christians and, and Peter is writing to them saying that they need to to stand firm. They need to to hang in there to hang with things, uh, and uh, and is trying to encourage them uh, to hold on to their faith and to continue to act like Jesus followers even when things are difficult around them. Uh, chapter 5 brings us to the end of his letter, uh, and uh, he begins uh, in the in, he, with the end. He, he talks to them about Christian conduct when you're under stress. How should Christians behave when they're under stress, when they're under difficult times? There have been a lot of studies done on group dynamics. And uh, they're very interesting studies talking about when groups of people get together. Uh, research studies have called groups of people together, people who didn't formally know each other. Uh, they ask them to kind of mill around and, and maybe get to know each other. And, and the people who are doing the study kind of watch what happens and, uh, and see what takes place. They kind of uh, they kind of uh, seek to determine, they've, they've kind of learned some things about the people before the people go into the group, know a little bit about some of their demographic information, some of their likes and dislikes. Uh, and, and so when these people get together, they, they begin to see the alliances that form and, and people that uh, get along, maybe even people that, that don't get along or don't have as much in common. Uh, they have some interesting times watching those and they're able to describe it. Uh, inevitably in these studies, uh, they decide to add some kind of stress into the group to see what happens. And usually it takes the, the form of, of introducing some kind of a task that they ask them to do together as a group. And uh, knowing that it's difficult, knowing that it's going to be a, uh, a challenge. Um, and, uh, and so when they do that, uh, different things happen. The, the group dynamic, after they, after they give this task out there, uh, the group dynamic changes almost uh, immediately. And it's, and it's a significant change. Uh, people go from being, you know, kind of polite and pretentious to into task mode. And they occupy kind of their personality role in doing the task. So you'll have some who are kind of the, the commanders. They take charge and start barking orders and telling people to do things. You have people who are more passive, and so they end up, well, I'll follow the directions and try to get this kind of thing done and do my piece of the task. You have some people who challenge the leaders. Uh, and, and sometimes they do it uh, outwardly and in aggressive ways, or sometimes they're passive aggressive and they challenge the leaders in that way. Uh, other times you have people who try to sabotage the leaders. They don't want the leader to succeed. And so they try to sabotage the leaders and the group, uh, the group moderators uh, are, are able to, to watch that happen. Um, you have some people who are comics and they'll emerge trying to, to laugh off the stress that's been added. Uh, you'll have rescuers in the group that come in and try to help people and, and uh, fray or uh, calm their frayed nerves and uh, help them to, to get through this. Um, and, and in each of these settings, the, the uh, observable fact is that stress changes things. And when people are under stress, it creates a difference in how they respond and how they re interact and how they react to one another. Uh, stress changes things. Well, think about where we're at now, uh, you know, in terms of the pandemic and this election that we've been through and the things that have gone on in 2020. 2020 certainly is going to be a, a memorable year and not in a lot of good ways. Uh, we're going to remember long the mass and social distancing and, and uh, trying to mitigate the spread of this virus, um, the numbers that we've seen every day of, of 
you know how many cases and how many people are hospitalized and how many people have died uh, we're going to remember that for the rest of our lives and uh, and remember what happened this year and how stressful that was we're going to remember how people responded during times of stress well Peter writing to a group of people who are undergoing persecution uh, are is writing to people who are recognizing the fact that things are changing when stress is added, that dynamics within the church are changing when this stress is added. And we've kind of seen that that take place too. Dynamics within the church change in different ways when stress is added. Um, but Peter's saying how you respond to this stressful situation, how you respond when you're persecuted is really, really important. You see, either people are going to see within us, they're going to see Jesus in our midst as we respond to this stress. They're going to be able to identify people as his followers because of how they respond to his stress. Or they'll see us as the selfish bunch of hypocrites that they always thought us to be. And I'm talking about worldly people. Uh, but they're going to watch during times of stress. They're watching us right now during this time of stress to see how do Christians respond. What are we seeing them? Ha what, what are we seeing within them? Are we seeing unity grow out of a time when stress has increased? Are we seeing are we seeing them get along and work together to help their community, or are we seeing like in every other group and every worldly group, uh, infighting, uh, people getting angry with what the leadership's doing, uh, that kind of a thing? How are we going to see them respond when stressful time happens? Well, we can see in Peter's letter uh, that he's dealing with some of those same things, especially here in, uh, in chapter 5, uh, because he begins by addressing the, the structure of leadership. And uh, he begins by talking to them about how they should respond to stressful situations. Let's start. We're going to read the first seven verses and uh, read that with me as I or follow along with me as I read that for you. First uh, Peter chapter 5, verse 1. To the elders among you, I appeal as a fellow elder and a witness of Christ's sufferings who also, who also share in the glory to be revealed. Be shepherds of God's flock that is under your care, watching over them, not because you must, but because you are willing, as God wants you to be, not pursuing dishonest gain, but eager to serve, not lording it over those entrusted to you, but being examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the crown of glory that will never fade away. In the same way, you who are younger, submit yourselves to the elders. All of you, clothe yourselves with humility uh, toward one another, because God opposes the proud, but shows favor to the humble. Humble yourselves, therefore, under God's mighty hand, that he may lift you up in due time. Cast all your anxiety on him, because he cares for you. Well, a couple of good quotable verses there at the end of that passage, verses uh, 6 and 7, are ones that uh, we should and probably already, many of you already have committed to memory uh, because they're great uh, things for us to remember when times, are, when times are difficult. So Peter starts out this last chapter, this, this closing uh, message in the, in the book of First Peter, in, in his letter, of, uh, this first letter that he's written uh, to the, to the uh, churches in the area that he's covering. Uh, and he talks to the elders. To the elders among you, he says, and, and I'm going to talk to you as a person who is an elder. And he, uh, uh, we, we're not sure exactly whether that was the church in Jerusalem or if he's moved to a different church by this point, maybe a church that's established in Rome and he's become an elder there. Uh, not sure how that works or, or, or what that looked like, but he says that he is an elder and that, that he's also an elder who was able to witness the sufferings of Jesus and plans to share in, in the glory to follow with all those who follow him. Uh, that, so he, him saying, I've seen Christ's suffering, uh, referring back to the former chapter, or chapters where he talks about the fact that Christians are suffering and and that they should endure suffering and uh, should should remain uh, faithful and remain and continue standing firm during suffering. Uh, but he, he's saying I've seen that happen and I know how we need to respond. And he talks about them being a good shepherd, being shepherds over God's flock that is under your care. 
Uh, he uses a shepherd analogy that would have been familiar, very familiar to the culture at that time. Uh, shepherding was probably the most common occupation, most common thing that, that was done then. Uh, there were sheep everywhere. They were, they were used for, to make clothing. Their, their wool was used to make clothing. Uh, their hides for, for clothing and shoes, their, their meat for food and that kind of a thing. Uh, they were a very common animal. Uh, one that was uh, seen on every road, everywhere, uh, in in all over where they were then, and uh, and so this idea of a shepherd uh, would have been a very familiar one to their culture. They knew that when that a that a shepherd had to to care for his sheep, and uh, and had to uh, had to give them care and had to continue to be vigilant to watch over them so that they didn't lose any of their sheep. And that's what Peter's encouraging uh, the elders in uh, in this chapter to do. We don't know uh, that that, but that he may have heard that some of those who are elders in the churches that uh, that he's writing to uh, are a little forceful. Or maybe a little domineering because he specifically addresses that uh, in this situation or in, or in his letter here. Uh, first of all, he says, you know, not because you must, don't watch over them because you must, but because you are willing to do so. Uh, Jesus, in uh, John chapter 10, John tells us that Jesus made a contrast between the shepherd who is the, the real shepherd, the shepherd of the sheep, the one who, who knows the shepherd's voice, and a hireling. Someone that the shepherd hires to, to watch over them while he's gone. And he says that a hireling will run away when trouble comes because he really doesn't care for him. Uh, but Peter here is saying that, that your attitude towards the sheep needs to be more of a shepherd attitude and not so much of a hireling attitude. Not because you have to or are compelled to, but because you want to, you get to. And, uh, and it's really important the motivation is because you love them. And because you care for them, uh, as as God does, um, and he talks about the idea of of uh, not getting dishonest gain, but eager to serve, uh, and, and the idea of not uh, not doing it for money, not greedy for money. In verse two, uh, in those days, some of the elders were paid staff at churches. They were they received an income from the church. Uh, generally speaking, the elder that was in charge of preaching and teaching uh, was considered to be paid staff. They were an elder, but they were also paid staff. Uh, that's why a lot of times, you know, when asking in Scripture what the difference between an elder and a minister is, well, they were one and the same uh, in, the, in the church back then, and so there is no real difference. Uh, the elders were, uh, there, there was an elder or a couple of elders who were paid staff, but he's saying here, you're not doing it for that. You're not doing it to, for the money. You're doing it because you love the people that you're with and, and you're trying to serve them. You're eager to serve them. Then in verse two, he says, not lording it over them. Well, what does that mean? The Greek word for lording it over it means uh, to domineer, not being domineering. In other words, uh, insisting on your way all the time. Insisting that people do things the way you want them to do them. Uh, there should never be any such thing as a head elder or someone who is so forceful with his will that, that he uh, uh, runs other people down and uh, gets his way every time. Um, so an elder should never be a, a control freak. Um, they should never be... Uh, just doing things their way because they can, because they're the boss and they can do it. Uh, they should always be uh, looking out for the best interests of the sheep and trying to and trying to do them, not lording it over, not not being a commander demander type, uh, but but simply but but leading from the position of serving. And that's what Jesus did, right? Uh, Jesus was he certainly had the authority to command people to do things, but Jesus led by example. Um, Jesus uh, submitted himself to others, to authorities and to others. Uh, he served others, even his own disciples when he washed their feet. He says, I'm giving this as an example to you. This is how I want you to, to lead other people by serving them and by showing them how excellent and how wonderful they are. And he, said, he says to the elders, as you do this, as you're that kind of an elder, uh, when the chief shepherd comes, you'll receive a crown of glory that will not fade away. So you'll be rewarded when Jesus comes. If you're the kind of elder that he calls you to be here. And so he's asking the elders to be uh, the kind of elders that are gentle, that are kind, that are caring and loving, uh, that are pastoral in how they uh, approach their, their leadership and who lead by example, 
not by uh, the command and not by being commanding and domineering. Um, that's really, really important. Then he turns to the people who serve under the elders. And he said, in the same way, you who are younger, submit yourselves to your, to your elders. All of you clothe yourselves with humility. It's really important that in the church structure that, that you have a leadership that's humble, uh, that, that makes decisions uh, based on their uh, uh, understanding of what the Holy Spirit's will is, what God's will is, listening to the voice of the Holy Spirit. They make those decisions, but they also do so in a humble way. They do so in a serving way and in a way that shows, that communicates love and concern uh, for the, the flock, the, the congregation that's under their care. But it's really important that as they do that, that the people under them be really committed to abiding by their decisions, to submitting to their wishes. Um, so often we have, you know, people in the congregation, uh, and, and it's not just, it's not our congregation, it's all congregations, uh, who love uh, what the elders are doing, love the decisions they make until... The elders make a decision they don't like, and then all of a sudden everything's terrible, and uh, and they're they're not going to do it. And I'm going to give my money to different things, and I'm going to do different. You know, I, I'm I'm not going to do what they want. They're not my bo that kind of a thing. Uh, and and here Peter's pointing out how important it is, especially in a situation where they're under stress, that they submit to the elders. That when the elders make a decision, when the elders make a request of them, that they assume that that decision is a decision of the Holy Spirit and that they're willing to submit to their elders. And then he says, everyone, clothe yourselves with humility. Elders and, and uh, others as well, clothe yourselves with humility because that's what God asks us to do. Uh, and especially, he says, towards one another. Clothe ourselves with humility towards one another. Put on a, a garment that, that put on our humble clothes and uh, and be willing to be humble in regards to one another. He quotes a passage from uh, Proverbs three thirty four where he says, "God opposes the proud, but shows favor to the humble." And that's that's God's attitude. Uh, God opposes the proud, those who are arrogant, those who are are uh, self serving and in it for self interest. And he but he gives grace to those who are humble, or he gives favor to those who are humble. And then in a, in a passage that we sing about, in a passage that we probably many of us have memorized, humble yourselves, therefore, under God's mighty hand, that he may lift you up in due time. We're to be a humble people. Christians are to be a humble people, and especially during times of difficulty especially during times of cha during challenging times like we're in right now, like the audience was in then. We need to be people who are humble, who are willing to submit to others, willing to show that we'll do whatever, we'll swallow our pride, we'll swallow uh, our wishes, we'll take less than our own way, and we'll do what we need to do in order to be humble. And he says, when you do that, when you humble yourself, allow God the time to lift you up. And in due time, he will. That God will lift you if you humble yourselves. And that's difficult. Humbling ourselves is difficult. It makes us feel out of control. Uh, we like to be in control. I think most of us uh, like to feel like we're in control of what's going on and, and what, what other people are doing. And, and that's really, really normal. Um, and when you give up control, it creates anxiety because I'm not sure what's going on here. And Peter addresses that too. Cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. No, that's an easy thing to say, and, and sometimes it's hard to do, uh, but it's a great strategy for anxiety, that when we're feeling that out-of-control feeling, when we're feeling like everything's kind of closing in on us, he says, cast your anxiety on him. Trust that God will take care of you. Trust that God will be there. He has your back, and know that even though you go through difficult times, even though you're going to go through some struggles and some stress and some trials, that God is there with you, and he will care for you. And that's a, that's a, that's a great uh, thought, a, a, a comforting thought as we go through anxious times, that if we can cast our anxiety on God and say, God, this is too big for me. I can't do this. I need for you to take it. Casting your anxiety on God because he cares for you. That's, a, that's great advice, something that we all need to be better at doing. Let's, uh, let's look at verse 8 then, and uh, read verses 8 through 11 uh, for this next section. Some great quotables here too. Uh, verse 8 uh, of chapter 5. Be alert and of sober mind. 
Your enemy, the devil, <clears throat> prowls around like a roaring lion, looking for someone to devour. Resist him, standing firm in the faith, because you know that the family of believers throughout the world is undergoing the same kind of sufferings. And the God of grace, who called you to his eternal glory in Christ, after you have suffered a little while, will himself restore you and make you strong, firm, and steadfast. To him be the power, forever and ever. Amen. So he's saying, uh, watch out, because at, at times like this, at times when you're under stress, at times when you feel out of control, are times when the devil, this roaring lion that he talks about, is going to come after you. He knows where you're weak, and he's going to hit you with the temptations that he knows uh, you're going to struggle with. That He's going to hit you where he knows you are the weakest. And during this time, you can expect that kind of thing to happen because the devil is going to try to use that. And then when you fall to those temptations, he's going to remind you what a loser you are, how little value you have, how nobody likes you. And he's going to try to drag you away and entice you to live in that kind of a sinful lifestyle. Because in doing so, he can drag you away from God. And ultimately, spiritually, he can take you to his realm and out of God's realm. And Peter's saying, don't do that. You want to resist the devil. Resist the temptation that comes from him. Resist the temptations to be unkind. Uh, resist the, the temptation to take license with things that, that you know you shouldn't do. Uh, resist the, the temptation to, to run away rather than stand with. Uh, resist the temptation to isolate rather than to, to be with others and to help others. Uh, the devil's going to want us to do those things. The devil's going to want us to, to move in, the, in an opposite direction from God. Uh, he's going to want us to depend on our own pride and our own will rather than casting our, our anxiety on God. Uh, he's going to want us to, to, uh, to, to mistreat others, to try to get a leg up during difficult and stressful times. God says, humble yourselves. Don't do what the devil says. He's trying to take you down. God is trying to lift you up. I think it's interesting uh, that, he's, that he talks about the fact that, uh, that once we've suffered for a little while, in due time, God will restore you. He'll make you strong, firm, and steadfast after you've suffered for a little while. And that tells us something interesting. I mean, it's something that we've known. Uh, you know, Psalm 23, I, though I go through the valley of the shadow of death, I'll fear no evil for you're with me. Your rod and your staff comfort me. Uh, in that, the psalmist doesn't tell us that we won't go through dark valleys. Uh, in fact, there's nowhere in Scripture that says that if you love God and, and if you love Jesus, that you won't have any difficult times. In fact, it says just the opposite. It says those who follow Jesus will suffer. Those who follow Jesus will have difficult times. And those who follow Jesus are going to struggle in this life for a little while. And then God will restore you. And so we can count on the fact that there are going to be times of struggle. There are going to be times when we have to deal with difficult people in our lives, difficult, challenging situations. We have to deal with loss. Uh, we have to deal with, with financial difficulties. Uh, all of those things are probably going to be, and, and maybe you know, all those things some of us are going to struggle with. Some of us may struggle with all of them. And yet we have to depend on the fact that even in difficult times, God will be with us. He is with us. He's going to allow us to struggle for a while, but then in due time, he'll lift us up and he's, he's got us. He's going to take care of us. He walks with us through those dark valleys and then he will set us up and make us strong. That's great comforting words also to know that, that suffering, these difficult times will make us stronger and then God will lift us up. He'll bring our suffering to an end. And I know with the, the struggles that 2020 has been, uh, God will bring our struggles to an end. They'll, they'll end at some point in time. And uh, we have great confidence, and we can know that God will take care of us in that time. The closing comments in chapter 5 are kind of uh, shout-outs that he's, he's giving to some of the people who have been involved in this letter. Um, he says in verse 12, With the help of Silas, whom I regard as a faithful brother, I have written you briefly, encouraging you and, and testifying that this uh, is the true grace of God. Stand, stand fast in it. Um, apparently Silas, uh, the one who was Paul's traveling companion at one point in time, uh, is there with Peter, wherever it is, we think probably Rome, uh, and he is helping him to write this. He is kind of serving as a scribe, uh, Peter dictating uh, the letter to him and, uh, and Silas writing, choosing the words. Um, a lot of people have said that, that Peter's writings, Peter's letters use excellent Greek uh, and uh, aren't written like someone who would have been a fisherman who wouldn't have had that 
that kind of education? Well, that's because Peter surrounded himself with people who knew how to write. And, uh, and so both uh, Silas and John Mark are people who, uh, who help Peter with his writing. Verse 13, it says, She who is in Babylon, chosen together with you, send her, sends you her greetings, and so does my son Mark undoubtedly John Mark, greet one another with the kiss of love. Peace to all of you who are in Christ. So she who is in Babylon, likely referring to the church that is in Rome. Babylon is kind of a code word that, that they sometimes used for Rome, uh, giving us again the indication that Peter is writing this from Rome. He has, he has Silas and Mark, John Mark, they're with him, and, uh, and they are helping him, assisting him in his ministry, and uh, he's sending greetings from the church in Rome then to the churches that he's writing to. Greet one another with the kiss of love. Um, how, how do, I don't, I've asked sometimes people who, who have that, uh, if the Bible says that I'm going to do it, uh, kind of a mentality. I, and I like that. I appreciate their willingness to want to do what the Bible says. Uh, but the fact is, is, is that there are times when we have to interpret the Bible for our situation. Um, greet one another with the kiss of love. We don't do that anymore. And uh, they did. If you go over in that area of the world, they still do. They kiss each other on the cheek for greetings. That's not what we do here in America. Um, and in fact, it would be weird if we did that. And so we can substitute that and say, greet one another warmly, whatever that looks like, right? In, in, in our culture, we might shake hands, we might give hugs, whatever that, whatever that looks like in our situation. That's what he's asking us to do there. Um, and then he offers them peace. So how can we close out these chapters, uh, how can we summarize what, uh, what's being said here? Again, we've talked about the fact that this church, the churches that Peter is writing to are churches who are undergoing an increased kind of persecution, probably persecution from the Roman government, uh, insisting on emperor worship, the, the worship of Nero in this case, and uh, insisting that they be involved in that, and Christians uh, saying that they can't be involved in that because they, don't, they won't bow a knee to Caesar. Uh, they, they serve they serve God, and they'll they'll kneel only to Jesus, and uh, that put them in a at, at a risky situation. Uh, that that gave them a struggle with uh, not only the people who lived around them, the Greeks and the Romans who lived around them, uh, but also the the Roman government and and, and officials. Uh, and Peter's saying you need to live among the pagans, live among those who believe differently than you do, uh, as aliens and strangers, as foreigners, and and uh, those who are living in a place that's not your own. Um, encouraging them. Them to live holy lives, to live lives that, that, are, uh, that are so holy, in fact, that, that those around you, though they may not agree with your beliefs, they're going to see your righteous way of life. And at some point in time, they'll honor and glorify God, either in, in this life or, or in judgment, uh, because they'll know that that goodness, that righteousness came from him and was a part of him. And, uh, and that's, what, uh, that's what he encourages them to do. Uh, even specifically, he said that they should submit to those who are in charge, um, that uh, even though those are the people who are persecuting you. He tells husbands and wives that they should treat each other with love and respect, even if one or the other uh, isn't a believer. Uh, in fact, to the wives, he specifically says, if you have an unbelieving sp spouse, you should try to win them over by living good, pure lives, not by putting, pre not by exerting pressure or nagging, but just living a good, pure life and showing them what it is to be a servant of Christ so that they'll want to do that too. Um, he talks about how they may have to suffer for doing good, but that if they have to suffer for doing good, that they should. Uh, in fact, suffering for doing good is far better than suffering for doing evil. And if they suffer, it should be for doing good. If you're punished for doing good, you'll be rewarded in, by, by God. But if you're punished for doing evil, there's no reward for that. Um, he says that, that a Christian who is suffering is done with sin. And so they can live godly lives and continue to do good even when they suffer. And that's an important point that he makes there. Continue to do good even while you're suffering, even to those who are treating you poorly. Continue to do good to them. In this chapter, he encouraged elders to lead by example. He, en he encouraged uh, church members to submit to their elders and to submit to one another, to be humble towards each other. And even in times of duress, they should stand firm, knowing that as you do, God will lift you up. Great words for a stressful year that we've had. To continue to remember that God sees what we're going through. That God will let us struggle for a time, but in due time, he will lift us up. We should do things that we've learned in this. We should live our lives as aliens and strangers in this world, knowing that this world is not our home. 
We should seek to comply with the wishes of the of government and of, of those around us, even if we don't agree with some of the things. Now, obviously, we don't do things they ask us to do that might not be godly. That would be where we draw the line. But even though we may not appreciate the people who are in power, we, ne- we need to continue to respect them and show them the respect that's due them. Uh, and we need, to, we need to honor one another. We need to serve one another. We need to submit to one another and to live humbly. That's how God asks us to respond to this stressful time. Casting our anxiety on him because he cares for you. With that, we're going to wrap it up. And we thank you for joining us for this study of First Peter. Uh, we're look, looking forward to next week jumping into Second Peter, finding out what he has to say to the group then. Looking forward to you joining us for that. We thank you for being with us tonight. Thank you. Da-da-da-da-da-da.